Just a quick reminder that one of the ways you can help support our podcast is to leave a review for our show over on iTunes. It really is one of the best ways to help people find the show. Thanks. Berlin says Beijing's been catfishing, and Beijing says no way. Banking Trojans and Google Play look for Polish accounts. Spider malware spins out of the Balkans. Transferring risk doesn't mean you can ignore it. The SEC calls cease and desist on another ICO. That venti in Buenos Aires may have come with a coin hive miner. And the doctor puts down his tools and closes Brickerbot. It's time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Recorded Future. If you haven't already done so, take a look at Recorded Future's Cyber Daily. We look at it. The CyberWire staff subscribes and consults it daily. The web is rich with indicators and warnings, but it's nearly impossible to collect them by eyeballing the Internet yourself, no matter how many analysts you might have on staff. And we're betting that however many you have, you haven't got enough. Recorded Future does the hard work for you by automatically collecting and organizing the entire web to identify new vulnerabilities and emerging threat indicators. Sign up for the Cyber Daily email to get the top trending technical indicators crossing the web. Cyber news, targeted industries, threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, malware, suspicious IP addresses, and much more. Subscribe today to stay ahead of the cyber attacks. Go to recordedfuture.com slash intel to subscribe for free threat intelligence updates from Recorded Future. That's recordedfuture.com slash intel. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Tuesday, December 12, 2017. In an unusual announcement, Germany's security agency BFV revealed the results of their long counterintelligence inquiry into how Chinese intelligence services use social media. LinkedIn drew particular attention, and BFD director Hans-Jörg Maassen said China is using the platform to collect information on targeted individuals. The Chinese services are said to have catfished more than 10,000 Germans. Most of the fictitious profiles used were swiftly taken down, but some journalists got a peek before the catfish spit the hook and vanished, and the profiles appeared to be what the BFV said they were. The Chinese Foreign Ministry dismisses the German report as groundless and hearsay, desiring Berlin to speak and act more responsibly. It would be surprising indeed if such an obvious way of prospecting people for recruitment or other exploitation weren't being pursued. This is just espionage tradecraft updated for social media. Instead of an intelligence officer telling a potential agent at a cocktail party, why, what a coincidence, I'm a stamp collector too. Now they do it online. ESET reports finding two apps in Google Play, Crypto Monitor and Story Saver, that in fact carry a banking trojan, aimed principally at Poland's financial sector. Crypto Monitor is an app that tracks cryptocurrency prices, and Story Saver represents itself as a third-party tool for downloading Instagram stories. Both of them scout infected devices for banking apps connected to 14 Polish banks. If they find them, the apps display phony login screens and steal user credentials. Netscope has identified a new ransomware strain, Spider, that appears to originate in the Balkans, probably in Bosnia. It's carried by an infected Microsoft Word document, and if an unwary user opens it, encrypts files and demands ransom in Bitcoin. Taking out insurance against cyber attack is a sensible way of transferring risk, but WatchGuard thinks it sees signs of small businesses in particular, thinking that insurance enables them to rest easy with poor cyber hygiene. This is particularly the case with respect to vulnerability to ransomware infestations. Marcel Lee is a threat researcher at Looking Glass, and she recently authored a report on the Bad Rabbit ransomware strain. She joins us with her insights on the malware campaign. We have an international team, and one of our researchers is actually based in Ukraine, which is where this Bad Rabbit activity first surfaced in Ukraine and Russia. Bad Rabbit, it's a multi-stage piece of malware. The way that it gets launched on a system is through basically an infected website. So most of the websites that were infected were based in Russia or Ukraine. 
And there's basically some malicious JavaScript that's running and has been injected into these websites. Once a user visits the website, that malicious JavaScript will run. And what the JavaScript does is basically um, harvest information about the host machine. So operating system, location, things of that nature. It sends that information off to a remote server. And then at that point, a Adobe Flash Player update window pops up, as they do. And if the, the user clicks on that, then that's basically the dropper for the malware. So the malware will be uh, loaded on the, the host at that point in time. None of this is the actual malware itself, right? It's just the mechanism to get the malware onto the host machine. Right. So once you've done that click of the fake update, the malware is dropped and all the ensuing activity begins. There's a number of different things that happen, but the primary thing, of course, is the file encryption. So after it goes through the whole encryption process, then the system basically reboots and you get the message saying, actually, it's kind of an amusing message because it says, oops, your files have been encrypted, like it happened by accident or right. something. Right. So yeah, so then uh, you're instructed with that message to visit an Onion site, Darknet, to obtain the decryption key and you're instructed to pay using Bitcoin, which is pretty typical for ransomware. Some interesting things about this malware were the Game of Thrones references. We're not really sure if the author just liked Game of Thrones and thought it'd be fun to throw some references in there or what the deal was with that, but um, just something kind of out of uh, the ordinary. There's definitely some similarities with the NotPetya malware that came out earlier this year. The message that pops up on the screen looks virtually exactly the same. Is this a situation where if you pay the ransom, you will get your files back? So maybe I would say, but mm. really, if you if you look at the Bitcoin wallets that were associated with this malware, or at least the ones that we've seen, there's been uh, very few transactions, like basically nothing new has happened in those wallets since the end of October when this first came out. Typically, the recommendation is not to pay ransom because it just really kind of encourages further activity of that nature. Right. That's what we recommend is not to pay the ransom. And Bad Rabbit is engineered to spread through your network. It just doesn't park itself on a single host. Correct, correct. So one of the things we observed in our analysis was it was leveraging SMB to reach out to other hosts. So if it did find other hosts on the network, then it would literally spread itself to those. So sort of that worm aspect as well. What are your recommendations for how people can best protect themselves uh, against bad rabbit? First of all, keeping software updated, and that's nothing new, right? Everybody knows you should keep your software current to hopefully prevent any vulnerabilities being leveraged. And then just disabling JavaScript in browsers is a good thing to do. Whether or not people want to go to that effort is another thing, but, um, but you can disable JavaScript and just whitelist applications or websites that actually need it. Utilizing browser security tools is another good practice. So a lot of browsers do have built-in security mechanisms that you can leverage, but again, that's uh, something that typically has to be turned on. Of course, user education is always good, helping our users understand when something is potentially malicious, what not to click on, which in my humble opinion is everything. <laughs> but, right, uh, right. but yeah, so I mean, the user education piece is always tricky. And I'm a huge advocate of making users part of the solution and, and not just always considering them part of the problem. Mm. Because I think if there's better awareness, more meaningful awareness, then they're more apt to help. It's a positive reinforcement versus negative reinforcement. It's way more effective. That's Marcel Lee from Looking Glass. You can read her full report on the Bad Rabbit ransomware on the Looking Glass blog. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission has stopped another ICO, this one for an operation called Munchie. Munchie had set up a $15 million token sale that would have funded the MunCoin, which would have been a payment system for restaurant reviews. The SEC reviewed them yesterday with a cease and desist order. The problem was that offering an instrument for sale with an expectation of return makes that instrument, legally speaking, a security. And if you're offering securities in the U.S., you ought to be registered with the SEC. Munchie also struck regulators as using what TechCrunch called the typically spammy and scammy marketing efforts most ICO floggers use now. 
In any event, Vopercoin was there first, and besides, the SEC's writ doesn't run to Moscow, so there was no similar issue with Burger King Russia's invitation to eat your way to riches, sandwich by sandwich. Munchie's site calls the company the new decentralized blockchain-based food review and social platform. The site is still up, but the links behind the homepage don't appear to be working. This isn't the only blockchain-based activity going on in cafe society. The blockchain apparently came to the barista, and it seems the barista knew nothing about it. At least one Starbucks Wi-Fi provider may have used the coffee shop's network to install a Monero miner in unwitting patrons' devices. It appears that patrons who belong to the coffee shop's rewards program in Argentina were unwittingly enlisted in CoinHive, whose JavaScript cryptocurrency miner extracts Monero. This seems to be the work of a third-party vendor, and not Starbucks itself. The vigilante known variously as The Doctor and The Janitor, the one responsible for Brickerbot, has indicated he's retiring. He claims to have bricked more than 10 million vulnerable IoT devices, thereby preventing them from being herded into malicious botnets. Dr. Janitor never got much love. He was regarded by many as a destructive, self-righteous pest and a lawbreaker, too. He himself felt misunderstood. As he put it in his valediction, reproduced in part by Bleeping Computer, quote, There's only so long that I can keep doing something like this before the government types are able to correlate my likely network routes. I've already been active far too long to remain safe. For a while now, my worst-case scenario hasn't been going to jail, but simply vanishing in the middle of the night, as soon as some unpleasant government figures out who I am." End quote. Please. Dr. Janitor was always far likelier to face public prosecution and a nickel in Oakdale than to vanish as an unperson down some Ministry of Love memory hole. At any rate, the janitor says he's retired and presumably moved to a nice active senior residence at Dunhaken. He did publish some of his source code in his exit manifesto, but not his SSH crawler, which he deemed too dangerous to publish, the way Tony Stark always insisted Iron Man's armor was just too overwhelming to place into the hands of the common man. That armor had the power of the transistor, after all. He did leave some advice behind, however, that's worth reading. It's most easily accessible at Bleeping Computer, because it advocates hygienic and policy measures for taking some of the DDoS risk out of the IoT. He urges the community to start using Shodan audits to find vulnerable ports and services, pushing IoT vendors to do better at security updating, working toward IoT security standards, and volunteering to fix vulnerable systems. And hackers, a pro tip. That kind of volunteer work may be a better outlet for your energies than a license plate shop at Virginia Correctional Enterprises, not to mention breaking rocks in the hot sun. Now I'd like to share a message from our sponsor, Nehemiah Security. Fellow cybersecurity leaders, when your CEO asks department heads for a status update, do you envy your colleagues like the VP of Sales or CFO who only have to pull a report from a single system instead of deploying a team of people to check multiple systems and then waiting for them to report back? Do you wish you had a single place to get the information you need to communicate with the CEO? Nehemiah Security is here to put that power in the hands of the cybersecurity leader. It's time for a quick solution that allows you to go to one place to get the security information you need, quickly and in business terms your CEO can understand. Nehemiah Security gives cybersecurity leaders the ability to report cyber risk in terms of dollars and cents. Visit NehemiahSecurity.com to learn more and get a free customized demo just for CyberWire listeners. Visit NehemiahSecurity.com today. That's N-E-H-E-M-I-A-H Security.com. And we thank Nehemiah Security for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Rick Howard. He is the Chief Security Officer at Palo Alto Networks, and he also heads up Unit 42, which is their threat intel team. Rick, welcome back. Um, not long ago, you and I were talking and uh, singing the praises about DevOps, uh, but uh, you are someone who uh, continues to evolve with your views and your opinions, and uh, today you wanted to uh, present to us that maybe it's time to think twice about DevOps. What are we doing here, Rick? Not exactly that. I would just say that DevOps is a philosophy. That's right. how I've come to terms with this, right? And okay. it's this idea that we should 
look at the way we deploy things and the way we update things in our environment as a system of systems, just like car manufacturers uh, make cars, right? They, the leaders of those manufacturing plants, they watch the system move through until they make the car. And they are, uh, they are very specific about taking every piece of inefficiency out of that system. The way we do it in automation, the way we do it in IT is the, some marketing guy comes up with an idea. We throw it over to a proof of concept developer. They build stuff. They throw it over the fence to the quality control folks, and they get it up to a you know version 1.0. Once they get it there, they throw it over the fence to the operators who install it and maintain it. And none of those people talk to each other in that process. Okay, And so the glue that moves it from process to process is not there. So DevOps is this idea that we should automate the entire process and view it as a system of systems. So I still believe in that philosophy. Okay. But when you read the literature about DevOps, you know, it's kind of highfalutin and not a lot of specifics about how you might go around doing this. What's emerged in the in the last six months that I've seen is this idea of site reliability engineers. And they originated out of the Google team uh, back in 2004 when they were trying to figure out how to scale this you know, search engine that they had come up with, right? right. Uh, and what they did was they handed the network manager off to a bunch of developers. That's an interesting idea, because when developers get stuff, they automate it, okay? So the Google site reliability engineers, right, they scale this operation. They automated everything, the glue that moves the part from piece to piece to piece so we can get it installed and maintained. They are so good at what they do it's almost autonomous. It's not just automatic. It's almost autonomous, meaning that their software can look for problems, roll it out, fix it, roll the fix back in all within the same day, all within the same couple of hours, right? Their philosophy on how to do this with their IT admins is that the Google IT admin shouldn't touch a box to fix anything more than 50% of the time, right? Because they want those folks to be automating the next process so they can scale even further. So DevOps, in my mind, is a philosophy where site reliability engineering is really the how-to uh, to get it all done. And here's my concern. Hmm. Okay, I, all that is fantastic, and there's lots of people working on it. Google's working, uh, Google and Netflix and Salesforce and Facebook. These are all examples of organizations who do this really well. But security people are still on the outside of that whole movement. Okay, and it doesn't make sense to me that as we automate the process from front to back, that you're leaving the security uh, expertise out of the system. So my advice to everybody listening is they need to get engaged with this conversation. They need to insert themselves into this DevOps philosophy and the site reliability engineering how-to stuff, uh, become very useful to the whole process so that security is not left out. Or in a couple of years, uh, our whole uh, network defender community is going to be irrelevant because we're not contributing to the effort. Did I convince you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'm definitely going to check it out. I'm going to read up on site reliability engineering. I can tell you that. So <laughs> <laughs> Great. I, my work is done here. <laughs> there you go. All right. Rick Howard, thanks for joining us. Thank you, sir. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can help protect you using artificial intelligence, check out Silence.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our show is produced by Pratt Street Media. Our editor is John Petrick. Social media editor is Jennifer Iben. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. <laughs>